Welcome to The Cynical Developer, the podcast that helps you to improve your development knowledge and career through explaining the latest and greatest in development technology and providing you with what you need to succeed as a developer. In this episode, we welcome back Aaron Upright. This time he's here to talk about dev estimates. And yes, you are always wrong. Aaron co-founded Zenhub in 2014 to help fast-moving software teams bring project management closer to the code. Aaron currently serves as a head of strategic accounts, managing both strategic partnerships and customer relationships, while helping current and prospective users to get the most out of their experience with Zenhub. Previous to Zenhub, Aaron served on the team of the Vancouver-based venture studio Axiom Zen, where he focused on developing go-to-market strategies for early-stage products. It was here that Aaron formed Zenhub. Aaron was last on the show back in February, and that episode was... Uh, 134 creativity to, for developers. So uh, go and check that out if you haven't uh, already, but make sure you check it out after the show. Um, and uh, this topic is is a little bit different, so uh, it's good to uh, to have you back on the show. So uh, welcome back, Aaron. Yeah, thanks again so much for having me, James. I'm really excited to be back on the show. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to have you back on and uh, on on a topic that uh, I don't think could be too far uh, or, or too much further apart than, than they are between the two topics. We had uh, creativity for developers, which most developers don't believe that they're, they're creative. And now it's um, back back into the nitty gritty every day, things that uh, developers would probably more associate with uh, with themselves and their job. Yeah, for sure. It was funny. It's it's the previous episode was how do we get developers into the flow and help them find focused time and now we're going to talk about a concept today, which is really, I think, essential to sprint planning, but is really, you know, a, a very concrete topic. And I think something that most developers don't typically enjoy. So hopefully we can soften that topic up a little bit. And hopefully those of you listening will, will kind of take some things away from this in terms of uh, you're interested in estimating how your team can get better at it. And some of the successes and learnings along the way as our team has kind of embarked on the journey to get better at estimating as well. Yeah, definitely. It's... um even with the with the years of experience that uh, that I've got, I must be cracking on for for nearly twenty years now. Is that I always go one way or the other with estimating. I'm either massively over or massively under. And um, at the time of recording, the client that I'm currently with um, has a PO on my uh, on my team, and uh, I always give him my estimates for stuff. And he says, "Right, okay, so you probably have that done in a third of that time." And I was like, "Look, the only reason I've delivered stuff sooner." rather than later than the uh, than the estimates at the moment on the projects we've currently been working on is they've been pretty straightforward and um it was hard to uh to miss the, those estimates but uh, when when we've now got a team of people there's there's three or four other devs working in the uh, in the same project i was like it becomes a very different ball game then i was like <laughs> if anything we'll probably miss yeah for sure yeah so i often uh, either overestimate my skills and ability or underestimate my skills and ability i I never know where i am i'm quite bipolar with uh, with that yeah i think you kind of hit it on the head too that it's you know really important that uh we understand i think as a team and really internalize that at at their core all estimates are wrong and you know we don't have a crystal ball to be able to see into the future and unforeseen things come up a lot of times we need to do our best to react in the moment and so I think even despite our best efforts, you know, we're never going to get to perfection when it comes to estimation. And like you said, there's always a tendency to, you know, kind of be over or under. It rarely seems that we can kind of get exactly where we need to be. But um, oftentimes, you know, that's not the purpose of estimation. It's to get us closer to, I think, where we want to be and to really start to develop that shared understanding as a team over time of, of how to actually, you know, estimate certain projects or estimate certain stories. And so we like to think about it as a process where the end outcome or the end goal isn't perfection. It's getting good enough to the point where, you know, we have estimates that we feel confident with. We have stories broken down and estimated, and that gives the team the ability to kind of accurately plan and then eventually predict and and start to get better at bringing in, you know, stories into the sprint and understanding our capacity and velocity. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think just, just to quiet down some of the people and I was probably screaming at their uh, their mobile phone or their or their car radio, that this isn't only uh, developers that uh, they get this wrong, but it's testers, um, it's um, managers. Every everybody gets it wrong because I think that uh, a lot of people always think super duper happy path with it, and they think about they look at a task and go, oh well, that's going to take me 
X amount of time to do it mm-hmm. on super duper happy path. They also don't take into consideration the QA time, the bill time, the delivery time, um, user acceptance testing, you know, all, all that sort of thing. They never, never bring any of that into, uh, into their estimates. Yeah. When teams think about estimating, one of the things we really suggest is that they should think about it through the lens of what their definition of done is. And for most teams, that concept of done means when working code has been deployed into production and it's actually in front of users. But if your team's definition of done is different than that, and for example, maybe something is done when your team is code complete and it's ready to be handed off to a QA team, then the estimates that you kind of apply to your story should reflect that. Um, it's also a big reason why we think that estimation should be, you know, complexity based rather than something that's a little bit more subjective like time. And I know I'm really getting into it here because this is a, a pretty age old debate, but, you know, <laughs> thinking through the lens of complexity, it does kind of force us to consider not only how difficult the actual development task is, but what actually comes beyond that. You know, for example, is this something that's re- going to require a lot of QA because it's a very user facing feature? Or does the deployment of this carry a lot of risk because it's touching elements of our production database and we can't afford to make mistakes there or else we're going to risk data loss for our customers? You know, and on that concept of the happy path versus, you know, the, the more ideal path or the, maybe the realistic path, it's also, I think, really important when teams are estimating or considering estimating to factor in that unknown. Um, for example, is the team going to be working with a new framework or a language that no one really has experience with? The estimate that you're using or you're putting forward Um, should reflect that, you know, and it's this idea, not that we're trying to pat our estimates uh, to make ourselves look better, but acknowledge the fact that with projects that we maybe don't know a lot about or that carry a significant more amount of risk, it's far more likely that we're going to run into things that we maybe didn't foresee at the beginning of the project or just in general don't have a great amount of experience with. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, that that lacking of experience... um, is is quite prevalent. Um, a a fact that was that was quoted to me um, today was that that most developers, on average, have five years experience. And if you have more than five years experience, you're pretty much an outlier um, <laughs> of on an average. And I think to to start becoming reasonably good, I wouldn't say perfect or very good at it, but reasonably good at estimating. You've got to have that experience to understand the process because mm-hmm. I think. You'd have juniors that maybe looked at a task and go, oh, well, that'll take me two hours to code it. But they they don't understand and have no concept of how long it takes to test things and, and as we said, deploy it. And that. so they're quite blinkered to, uh, to what goes on around that. Now, one thing that I tend to um, argue for is probably, probably the right word, um, is that we don't actually estimate the story straight away is that I would always like to break that story down into the deliverables. So the do the code bit, uh, do the databasey bit, maybe if it, if it, if it exists and and databasey is definitely a technical term, um, test it, user acceptance, test it, integration, test it, uh, right. Automation tests, get all of that into, uh, into subtask under it and estimate the subtasks. And then you could, take those together and put those as your as your uh estimate for the the overall task i think breaking it things down into the smallest possible components always at least for me gives me a clearer vision of what it is that um that you want to achieve because i think that you would look at a task sometimes and you go oh well that looks simple and then as soon as you start breaking it down you go oh well there's this nuance and there's this caveat and and things like that. You got any uh, opinions on that? It, does that fly in the face of, of everything that uh, that you stand for? No, I actually really agree with that. And like an old mentor of mine, I think one of the um, kind of the most powerful analogies that he used that really got me thinking about estimation in that way is kind of painting a house or painting an apartment. Because if I ask you how long it's going to take to paint your house, or how difficult, or how much effort you think it's going to paint your house. Uh, to be to paint your house, it's a really difficult thing to answer. But once you start thinking about it in the the lens of the different rooms that you may have to paint, well, you know, it's it's pretty clear to see that your living room is probably bigger than your bedroom and your bedroom and living room are probably bigger than your kitchen. And that really breaking things down into those different components or in that analogy, breaking down a house into its individual rooms really helps us kind of better estimate and better understand the complexity and the effort or the difficulty that's going to be involved in each kind of component of what we're doing. So I absolutely agree with that. If we're trying to tackle a feature or we're trying to build something, breaking it down into its components, you know, even 
whether that means different parts of the feature, or like you said, even beyond that, you know, writing automated tests for what we're doing, writing actual QA tests for what we're doing, the actual active deployment, considering all of those as not necessarily separate tasks, but separate components to this, this, um, you know, feature of this thing that we're trying to build really does help us, I think, more accurately estimate and be able to kind of estimate relative to the other parts of that task as well, which um, oftentimes, you know, can make it easier because it's, it's not always clear how long things are going to take or how difficult their things are, are going to be, especially if we don't have a lot of experience having done them before, or if they're relatively new things for the team. Yeah. Yeah. One of the other things I like about um, breaking them down into those specific uh, role-based tasks, if you like, is um, the QA people. If So let's roll it back a little bit. If you're doing something like planning poker to, to estimate it, you, you're all voting on what you think the size of a task would be. Mm-hmm. Now, if you put it into those role-based tasks, you've got expertise in those roles. You've got the devs that are the experts in writing the code. You've got the QA uh, members that are the experts in writing the QA stuff. And still estimate, in, you know, the whole team should still estimate each of those tasks. But you've then got, some extra weight that you could give to the experts on that uh, on that voting team. And I think that that also cuts down the debate afterwards because sometimes you'll do a task and the QA you'll put, I don't know, 20 and, and a dev will put two. And then the, the QA has to explain for, for 15, 20 minutes as to why it's so uh, so complicated. But the dev would just argue, well, it's really simple to build. Yeah, yeah it's very simple, but there's a lot of uh, ways to interact with it in the UI or, or something like that. Whereas straight off the bat you go well the three qas think it's a 20 um which means that they probably understand that the dev's not that much but the testing's a lot more so you know give it give it that way and vice versa for every every other role Mm -hmm. yeah i mean we we learned that lesson the hard way that it's really important for the people that are going to be actually delivering you know these different tasks or delivering these different stories to be really involved in actually estimating them because well, estimation, I think, should be a group exercise and a team exercise that everyone gets involved in. You have to bring those different perspectives in. And ultimately, like you said, someone who's maybe seen something similar before in a QA function is going to probably be able to provide the most accurate you know, estimate to that. It doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't respect or involve other opinions in that. But like you said, we might want to weight that more strongly. I think it also gives a, the a opportunity for people who naturally have a better understanding of those different functional areas or those different functional parts of a project to also kind of disseminate that learning to other members of the team. So it's not just about, hey, we're going to take, you know, blindly the estimate that our QA, you know, tester gives us and just go ahead with that because they probably know best. But it's also a learning and educational opportunity for that QA tester to be able to not necessarily defend, but explain their estimate and kind of up-level everyone's knowledge on the team as to why this is maybe more complex than what people originally thought. And so that kind of healthy debate, I think, can lead to a lot of opportunities for teams to actually get better at estimating in the future and to maybe learn about different functional areas that they typically wouldn't otherwise see. If we just said, hey, all the QA people are going to estimate the QA task, all the developers are going to, or, or sorry, front end developers are going to estimate the front end tasks, and all of our back end teams are going to, you know, estimate the back end tasks. Yeah. So you you mentioned there that everybody should uh, estimate uh, all tasks and uh, and that's something I also talked about but um if uh, if all the chefs are involved do they not uh, spoil the broth to uh, to bastardize a uh, a quote yeah <laughs> or a saying <laughs> i mean having multiple cooks in the kitchen can make things more complicated um you know for example like we just said what happens when estimates between different team members widely differ who gets that final say is it the person who kind of owns that domain on the team or um, do we go with kind of more of the team opinion and again our process in that and what we found really successful and what we recommend to other teams is to allow people to share their viewpoints or perspectives on why they think the story or the task might be more or less complicated from there, we have our team vote again. And if we're still undecided on that, rather than kind of continuing that conversation in a, in a group setting, we simply try to pick an estimate in the middle and move on. And you know, coming back to what I talked about a little bit earlier in our conversation, I think our goal of estimation should be to strive for kind of good enough, uh, not for perfection. It's one of those few things where I think you know, good enough is, is truly good enough. Um, and there's such a law of diminishing returns, I find, when we spend more time on estimates, it doesn't necessarily mean better results. Because even if we take, you know, 30 minutes in a stand-up, or sorry, not a, a stand-up, in a sprint planning meeting to align on what a, uh, our estimates might mean, 
you know, at the end of the day, that doesn't necessarily get us any closer to being able to deliver that, you know, and uh, help us maybe spot some of those unforeseen things that are come up are going to come up in the project or uh, be able to deliver it necessarily any sooner. There's, there's not that specific correlation always. Um, and so we try to spend not too much time on it. If we do have those disagreements or those kind of arguments on the team, you know, really just picking something in the middle and moving on, we found is a pretty effective approach to that. Um, especially like you said, when you have a lot of people involved in the estimation process. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> Some situations that I've come across in the past, and and uh, I come across quite regularly as well. Uh, to be fair, is estimating a task, and then it depending on who picks it up. So uh, a recent um, example is that uh, I'm mentoring somebody at the moment. They they want to become a developer, so they're very new. Um, they they're not even quite a junior developer yet, and they were working on a project for two weeks. Um, and they wanted me to look over their code. They showed me what they were doing. I explained what they were doing. I said, right. I said, what I will do before I actually get your code down and do anything with it, I'm going to go away and write the the code for this project. Mm -hmm. Now, they'd been working on that for, for two weeks. I wrote that code in half an hour for the whole project that took them two weeks. And yes, this is this is outside of, of working uh, and deliverables for uh, for a client or anything. But but surely that still still applies in a client setting where you're trying to deliver a real world product. How how do you combat that with with estimating? Yeah, I think one of the ways that we've found to be useful in combating it is to really try to steer away from sizing stories in terms of time. Um, and the reason being is that time is a, a highly subjective thing versus uh, maybe like t-shirt sizes or actual story points, which are something the entire team can come together and kind of agree upon. And that example you just mentioned is a perfect one. You know, if you're a seasoned senior developer that has 20 years of experience and I'm a junior developer that's only been in the industry for a couple of years, there's going to be a really big gap and a really big difference between our technical capabilities. And so if we're both asked how long something's going to take, it's likely that nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100 that your reply is going to be far shorter than, than what my reply is. You may have seen similar problems or implementations in the past, whereas this might be the first time that I'm actually going through, like you said, and kind of seeing this particular problem. And um, further than that, you know, let's pretend that maybe you have 10 years of experience working with the language that this is being written in. And again, maybe for me, this is the first time that I'm actually working with this language and I can work my way around in it, but it's going to take a considerable more amount of time or a considerable longer amount of time to kind of get up to speed on, on how to use, you know, a certain framework or a certain language. So again, if we estimate purely based in time, our estimates are going to be wildly different because they're reflective of our backgrounds, our experience, our different skill sets that we have. And so to kind of circumvent that and to get around it, you know, this is why we, we kind of lean heavily on the concept of story points or t-shirt sizing, because they aren't as influenced by, I think, the skills and experience of the person that's estimating. Now, you might, you know, of course, think something is less difficult or less complex or is going to require less effort, you know, of course, based on your skill set and your background. Um, but that's why it's essential, I think, as a team, if you're going to be using story points or t-shirt sizing, that you develop that shared understanding of what that point system means before you all go off and start to use it. That's, I think, a, something that a lot of teams kind of, it's a nuance that, that a lot of teams overlook, which is if you're going to be using that style of estimation, everyone on the team should have a shared understanding of what a story point value of five means relative to an eight. Um, otherwise, if you just go off and you know, let people estimate things on their own without having that context, the numbers all mean different things to different people. So it's really important that if you're going to adopt that style of estimation, that you have a set definition almost of what each of those point values mean, and that it's agreed upon and understood across the entire team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just to uh, to put uh, my own bragging rights back into uh, into into context, bring it back down to reality. I'm uh, I'm learning a new uh, a new technology at the moment. I spent four hours last night just setting the project up, and I had to redo it twice um, <laughs> before I got it working. So uh, it's not always uh, a bed of roses when. Um, when you've got some some experience uh, working, yeah. but, um, you you spoke there about story points and relative sizing and and things like that, um, and how it doesn't really matter if it's a five for a seasoned developer or five for 
a junior developer that's never seen a language before and doesn't know what a keyboard and mouse is maybe. Um, but what if, if that's the case, what, what do those points mean? Surely they're irrelevant. They're, they can't be used to measure anything. Yeah, well, I, I think the whole idea is that these points are kind of relative to other things that we've done in the past. And it's kind of, you know, herein lies the difficulty, I think, of adopting estimation. And the first point is that the estimation is all based on relative complexity. Well, then where do you start? Because you don't really have that relative baseline. Yep. So, you know, it, it's always a difficult thing, I think, and a difficult uh, hurdle for teams to get over. You know, what we did and what we find a lot of teams do is just pick something that seems like a medium task you know, and then from there, start to work out if things are more complicated or require more effort, or if things are less complicated and are going to require less effort from that. But again, the idea is that, you know, not intrinsically that we know exactly what a three is, but we start to develop this understanding of what certain tasks and stories that are always given threes or fours start to look like, so that from that, we can very quickly surmise, you know, if a story is going to be more complicated than that or less complicated but, uh, uh, than that, and assign it a point value kind of appropriately. So that's where, where I think at least that the concept of relative estimation um, really helps because you know, after several weeks or several iterations and sprints of doing that, you start to get a pretty good idea of, okay, this task that's coming up looks kind of similar to this other task. And, you know, we said that was a three. So maybe this should be in that range at least. We're, you know, not sure if it's a three or a four, but we're definitely not going to be giving that at, you know, eight or a, a 13 in terms of story points. That's just way too much. So um, that kind mm -hmm. of relativity does, I think, help at least get us uh, closer to where we should be. And again, in the pursuit of good enough, not perfection, um, hopefully that's enough to be able to move forward with as a team. Yeah. So if it's a relative number based on complexity of a task, and as you said, it may take a senior a day, it may take a junior two weeks to, to do. Mm -hmm. um, how does the business use that? Because in reality, I would say 90% of all software projects have hard deadlines and hard deadlines should be in uh, in bunny quotes because they all, they always get moved either forwards or we miss them so they get pushed back mm -hmm. but um how how does somebody take so like a senior developer or a product owner or somebody like that, take those relative numbers back to the business and say right we've scoped out the project we've realized that it's going to be x number of sprints before we have something that um, is going to be the finished product that you could push to the customer and that's ignoring the fact that you should have a deliverable at the end of every sprint but even, even even if it is a deliverable doesn't mean it's customer deliverable um how, how does that, that person go back to the business and have the business understand the uh, the costs and when it can go? Because some products and that are going to have to have marketing budgets and things like that and, and advertising probably kicking off for, for a product. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, that's that's where really I think we need to think about estimates not as the end goal, but as a means to an end. And that end, I think, is understanding our velocity and our capacity as a team. Velocity is an agile term that essentially, you know, helps us understand effectively the number of story points that we can take on over a given time period. And ideally, that time period is fixed. It's always two weeks or three weeks or four weeks or um, some custom time period that works best for your team. And I think that understanding of velocity and capacity, meaning you know we can take on X number of story points over a two-week period, really helps give us that predictability in terms of not only being able to plan out sprints in advance, but when we can relatively deliver something. Now, so for example, if we know that in a given two-week sprint for our team that we can get done about 50 story points, and that accounts for everyone on the team, right? Um, whether it's a junior developer, a senior developer, anyone who's intermediary, the combined effort of everyone on that team can get done about 50 points. If the feature that we're trying to work on is 150 points, you know, that's about three, three sprint cycles that we're going to have to take in order to get there. And if our sprint cycles are two weeks long, typically then on average, that's going to take us about six weeks by, by time we're actually able to deliver that feature into production or at least deliver it into a state that's closer to production. That's never going to be a perfect you know, um, estimate up front at least, but that starts to give us some relative predictability in terms of, hey, are we talking six weeks to be able to deliver this feature or six months? Then once we start to get actually closer to the you know, delivery of that feature, maybe it's the last sprint cycle that we're in, we're finishing up those last points, you know, that's when we should have a lot more certainty in terms of the exact you know, delivery date or um, hopefully a closer delivery date for that. So 
Um, that's always what we do in, in terms of building new features and trying to figure out, um, you know, when they're going to uh, eventually be, uh, be in a position where they can be brought to market is kind of use our velocity and our, our sprint cadence, which is two weeks, to kind of uh, model out how long something's going to take. Know that marketing then needs to engage kind of in that last sprint and that as we kind of narrow down to that last sprint, we need to pick a actual physical date to work towards. And then, you know, maybe that last sprint has a little bit more work involved in it. People are pulling a little bit longer hours or working a little bit more over time in order to get to that finish line. Because um, again, it's it's not ever going to be perfect. But roughly, you know, we understand the time commitment involved and how long something is going to take. This episode is sponsored by Honey Budget. So let's face it, your code is going to have errors. Even code written by such an amazing developer as myself is going to have problems. And when those errors do creep in, it's nice to know that Honey Badger's got your back. Honey Badger makes you a DevOps hero by combining error monitoring, uptime monitoring, and check-in monitoring. And that's all in a single, easy-to-use platform. And all way less for what you're probably paying now, if you're paying anything, because are you monitoring? You probably should be. Honey Badger monitors and sends alerts real time with all the context needed to see what's causing the error and where it's hiding in your code so you can quickly fix it and get back to being awesome. The included uptime and check-in monitoring also lets you know when your external services are having issues or your background jobs maybe go missing or they just silently fail. So go to honeybadger.io and discover how Star, Josh and Ben created a 100% bootstrapped monitoring solution. Why is this important? Self-funding means that they only answer to you, the developer, rather than a venture capital overlord. So you're in control. So go check out Honey Badger after the show. Tell them the cynical developer sent you when you're signing up and they'll give you 30% off for six months. The discount will be applied to your account and no credit card is required. But for now, let's get back to the show. If we are basing our delivery day on a date that becomes more apparent the closer we get to, uh, to completing the project, should we not then essentially just um, get rid of estimates, just don't do estimates? Uh, uh, that's going to be a real hard sell to, to the business though, isn't it? Yeah, I think there's, there's very few situations that can work. And in fact, the only counterpoint to that or counterexample I've seen where not estimating at all, whether it's you know, time-based or story point-based or t-shirt size-based works, is if you know, you're a very small team of you know, developers with relatively the same skill set and can work in a way that's autonomous. And to be you know, frank, the, the example where we've seen that most is early stage companies where everyone on that development team is relatively senior um, you know, and is comfortable enough in their career and where they're at to be able to work autonomously and to be able to kind of just pick up tasks off the top of the backlog, be able to work on that kind of independently, um, and then you know, be able to deliver that. Doing that, though, still requires the team to align on what work is the highest priority to really make sure that people are working on the different stories and tasks that represent that most important work to the business. So just because people are you know, maybe senior uh, in their career and can work in a more autonomous way doesn't mean that we don't need to do the same rituals to align on what that most important work is or what those highest priority tasks are. In addition to that, I, I also think the team needs to make time to align and keep each other up to date on progress, blockers, unforeseen issues coming up. Those are all things that typically would come up in stand-ups or would come up when we're looking at a burndown chart and trying to understand maybe where we are in the sprint. And if your team isn't going to be estimating or sprinting and is just kind of picking up tasks off the top of your backlog, you need to physically make that time, whether it's a meeting or whether it's a, you know informal stand-up that's happening on Slack or Microsoft Teams to align on you know uh, progress as it's happening and if blockers, like I said, are coming up, um, uh, align on you know how to get rid of those or or who can maybe step in to help. So that's maybe one of the examples where we've seen that estimation um, or teams can use uh, make progress without uh, estimating. But I would say that is the exception, not not necessarily the norm. And it definitely starts to break down even as you add more people to that team. Um, you know that use case of several you know senior developers working together and not estimating. You know, it, it kind of works, but as soon as you start to get teams of 5, 10, 15 people, the teams probably shouldn't be bigger than that. Um, but as you start to get up to those numbers, it does become really important to have more of a process as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that um, when I've worked solo on a project and I'm comfortable with uh, with the technology that we're using, I may have built similar, if not the same project 
a hundred times previously. I can I can pretty much look at the whole project from a really high level, from maybe in a, even the epic level, and go, yeah, I could probably deliver that to you in a month's time. Um, you know, including testing and all that sort of stuff. That there isn't anything else there. But um, as you say, once you start adding more developers in there, if you've got more developers coming in, it's not necessarily to deliver the project faster. It's probably more the fact that there is more work to do because it's more complicated. There's more distinct pieces of work. Um, so uh, so things so- suddenly spiral out massively. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and you do find yourself sitting there going, well, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I know that um, picking up, uh, brand new projects uh, with new infrastructure that you've never used before, new uh, programming languages that you may have new, not used before, that uh, that throws out um, estimates massively. And uh, I think that can actually knock your confidence a little bit because I know I've, I've looked at a task and gone, well, if I was to build that in the way that I normally build stuff, I could probably have that done in a day. But this is completely unknown because I, I don't know Google Cloud Platform. I don't know Go programming language, um, and I don't know how to uh, even get the the code from my computer built through a pipeline somewhere and, and, and into that. I don't even know what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do we estimate that? But uh, but sometimes that, that that situation doesn't come up until you get to the uh, the sprint planning uh, point because you've not been involved in the and in the program in the uh, in the project up until that point. Then that can be uh, be very difficult. Yeah, I think one of the things that we found really helpful to kind of combat that is the um, idea of a development spike. I'm not sure if it's something it's you know you're familiar with, but you can mm-hmm. think of a spike yeah. as a maybe a special kind of user story that we do in advance of actually working on the the actual user story. And a spike in reality looks a lot like a short research project to dig into a particular part of the project to try to understand that part better and maybe the potential risk that might come up as we embark on that part of the project. And like you said, they're really well suited for situations where we might be developing something new, using a new framework or language, interacting with a new library or a set of APIs that maybe isn't very well documented or that we've never used before, or maybe working on something that has a ton of potential technical risk associated with it. And those development spikes can really help us understand the complexity of that project. And from there, better estimate the eventual set of user stories um, that the team will actually be working on so that we really reduce that risk of getting blindsided midway through the project and figuring out that, you know, as we're half the way through a particular user story that we're just fundamentally wrong about how we thought we might want to implement that. Um, And so that's a really useful tactic that we've actually found and we employ quite a bit internally at Zen Hub um, to, to help alleviate those you know, unknown unknowns and getting blindsided in the middle of our sprints and have to completely switch what we're working on. One thing I will say is that if you're going to be doing a development spike, or if you're going to be testing out that approach, we're big believers that you should assign some story point value or some complexity value um, or estimate to that spike, because it does actually take up capacity during a sprint. You know, part of the team is going to be focused on doing that research and doing that work to understand the project a little bit better and to start to break down maybe some of that technical complexity and risk. And so we just advise on that, that it's not free work. It's not uh, work that's happening off the side of someone's desk or that people are working overtime on. Just make sure to reflect it, you know, in terms of a point value or an estimate value, um, because it is going to be work that probably happens within a sprint and ties up some of your team's capacity, at least from being able to do other things. Yeah. Yeah. So as soon as you said the word spike, I had a question. And uh, the way that you've uh, you've worded that has uh, has nicely segued into into my question, which is uh, we've talked about relative sizing over doing what I call ideal days or time estimates. Now, I think that you should um, give, as you said, some sort of size to a to a spike, but probably. In, in my opinion, not a, a relative point size, but actually um, a time time span. You know, so time box it to be mm-hmm. a day or two days worth of work. And, it, and if you achieve what you want to achieve, then then great. And if you don't, tough. Or should should it really just be well? It's as long as it takes. This is what we want to build in the spike um, that you have to keep going in, until that's done. What, yeah. What's your uh, your stance on that? Well, I mean, you make a really good point there, and that hey, if we just spend all of our time on the spike, what really determines, you know, when we're done that, like we can do research until, 
you know, the cows come home in terms of, of trying to figure out the complexity of something and where does that actually start to transform into, you know, from research into actually working on the project. So I like that idea of time boxing and saying, hey, we're going to do our best within, you know, uh, this day or these 24 hours or this eight hour work day kind of thing, however you want to break that up. Um, to best understand this particular task and then move on from there. And yeah, of course, there's going to be things that we maybe don't, you know, didn't foresee or um, things that we, we, you know, didn't uncover during the spike that we're going to have to deal with later, but we're far better suited and we're in a far better position than we would have had been had we not done this spike. So um, I, I agree with that. I really like that concept of time boxing a spike and saying, we're only going to spend a certain amount of time on that just to make sure that that work doesn't just bleed over into actually doing the work. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, something that um, I try to to push onto the developers that I work with um, is that if you are doing a spike, that this is not an excuse to do crappy code, to put it as nicely as I can. Mm -hmm. It should be readable code that people can come back and look at because once you've done that spike, it could well be that you've pretty much achieved what you want to or, or close as, as damn it to, to what you want to achieve in in the real world. So it should be in a format and, and in a fit state that you could actually look at it and go, right, okay, or I can I can pinch a bit, bit of that or I can see that really, uh, really obvious mm -hmm. um, on how I do this uh, this piece of work. Yeah. Uh, I, de I definitely worked um, with, uh, with clients who have had teams that have done a spike um, I've come in and they've gone, yeah, we've just completed the spike and, and this is what they've done. They sort of maybe demo it. I go, all right, okay, cool. Right, Let, let's go and uh, implement that. So looking at what you've actually built, we're pretty much there. We're 80% we're of the way there, say. So so let's, how much of that can we use? Oh, um, nothing, none of it. Because <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's in a different language um, or it's um, in a, uh, in just, just an unfit state. Yeah. It's in one massive class um, with loads of overlap. And at the time of writing, only that developer and God knew how that code worked. <laughs> and unfortunately, now only God knows. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, taking some time to uh, to make sure that you're... I'm not saying write test-driven development and that your code's pretty and elegant and it's all single purpose, you know, solid principles, and that, but, but make it usable. Please, please make it usable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another way that we like to think about spikes too, in, in addition to that is, you know, the output or outcome of a spike should be learnings, not always uh, production ready code, right? Um, yeah. The more that we we learn from that process, and uh, the more that we uncover in that process of actually doing a technical spike, the better we are to actually, or the better suited we are, I guess I should say, to actually go through and develop that in the way that we want to develop it. The output of a spike should not be something that's ready or production ready, Um you know, it's great if it if it is, and there's a lot of situations where we've actually gone into spikes and found out that we were actually overcomplicating things. And it's always a pleasant surprise when you um, can find a solution or a technical solution far more quickly yeah. than you originally thought. In that case, yeah, maybe we can pivot very quickly to transforming that into something that, that looks a lot more like work and code. But we always focus on trying to get to learnings rather than trying to get to, um, you know, production ready code from a spike because... Uh, again, if if we're just focused solely on, hey, can we make this thing work? We're going to run into the exact same problems that you mentioned of, yeah, it works in this one situation, but not in these other situations. It's not well documented. So now, unfortunately, anyone else that has to use this component or anyone else that has to touch this code base going forward is going to have no clue how it was built or no understanding or idea of, of um, how we actually constructed this. So yeah, that's that's really important to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. So I think we've uh, we've touched on a few a few points there. Well, a lot of points of, of why we're bad at it, and and a few little points as to uh, to to how we could possibly improve it. But um, just to, to to be really obvious to to the listeners out there, what could they do? What could we do to uh, to make our estimates better? Yeah, I think the biggest piece of I can, uh, advice that I can give is is you know if you're not estimating, start estimating. You know, do it. Um, so much of estimation is about learning and calibrating before you you get it right and you get to a point where those estimates um, actually have meaning behind them and they're something that's useful for the team. And I think the more that you kind of put that off and put that off and put that off and say we're not right, you know, quite ready for estimation. You know, we really want to figure other things out before and you don't just get that experience and that muscle memory of doing it, you're really kind of setting yourself behind. And so it is, is very much a process. I think that's learned by doing it. 
Um, so for teams that aren't, um, you know, using estimates uh, today, it's definitely something that you, you, I always recommend that, you know, teams kind of jump in with both feet. Um, I think for teams that are, you know, starting out with estimation, one of the recommendations we always have is to try to keep it simple. Um, this is where I think the concept of t-shirt sizing is a great way for teams to get started and thinking about how those different sizes of stories compare in terms of effort and complexity relative to other stories. You know, it's easier to do that when you only have four different values that you have to choose between as opposed to an entire Fibonacci sequence that has maybe 12 or 13 different values in it. Um, it can be a lot easier to say, hey, is this small, medium, large, or extra large versus is it, you know, 1, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, and, and, and so on kind of thing that, that can introduce a lot of complexity into it early on. So that's another thing that we really recommend is if you're, if you're going to go down this path, you know, start simple, start to derive, you know, meaning behind these different points that you're using, um, you know, start to just get into the pattern of doing it and get into the habit of doing it. And then once you start to get comfortable, you know, you can integrate those different patterns, like I said, like a sequence that has a lot more numbers in it um, that allows for more detailed estimating. Um, but when your team really understands those nuances and differences between those numbers, and this is this is kind of a you know another plug, um, you know maybe in terms of of how we think about the future here at ZenHub, but we also think that tools should play I think a bigger role in this going forward as well. Um, a lot of the times, you know, estimation is just left up to the team to do, and the tools really don't help facilitate that or help teams who haven't estimated, uh, you know you know, get better at doing that or start to introduce it into their process. And this is definitely us, uh, you know, tipping our, uh, our hat in terms of the direction that we're moving in. But as a product, we almost feel compelled that if we're going to help teams, you know, really reduce the amount of time that they're spending on this repetitive work, like backlog grooming and sprint planning, that as a tool, we should help facilitate these things and get better at, uh, and help teams get better at them. So um, I think a, a certain amount of it is, is, you know, just doing it, getting those repetitions as a team, I think as we look forward as a business, it's definitely one of those things, though, that we want to help teams get better at, take a more opinionated stance on and really through the product lens, you know, help automate some of that for teams as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's all good, good, solid advice. And um, you talked about T-shirt sizing and keeping it simple. Um, I did uh, see T-shirt sizing with one person where they didn't just have small, medium, large, and extra large. They had extra small, small, medium large, extra large, extra, extra large, triple XL. <laughs> <laughs> they went the whole hog and they were, they were one step away from, uh, you might as well just use the Fibonacci sequence. Exactly. Um, although one thing no one's ever been able to tell me is that Fibonacci sequence has one in it twice. So uh, is one and, and one, are, are they two different things when you come to uh, exercise with uh, um, <laughs> the uh, the Fibonacci sequence with uh, with estimating? We just use the, the one <laughs> case of that. So um, in sometimes, like in some cases, I think we actually integrated a, a ha half decimal estimate in, into uh, our process as well for something that's actually smaller than a one. But, um, you know, I think we've, I think we've kind of scrapped that moving forward just because if something is going to be that easy and it's, it's relatively understood by the team, you know, just go ahead and do it. Um, you know, we're, we're a startup, we kind of have to move fast. And I think a lot of teams are in that position too, where if it's, blatantly obvious that this isn't something that's going to require a lot of effort just get it done and, and don't bother to yeah. uh to maybe put even the smallest point value against it so sure sure yeah that's uh it's good it's uh it's definitely a hot topic and i think it's a topic that we could uh debate for for a long time um there are definite uh camps should we say in uh in, in how you go about doing all the uh the estimates but um like with uh, like with everything in tech, yeah, I think it's uh, find what works best for you and your team. I think is uh, is uh, is a good good strategy. Mm -hmm. I could agree it's, more with that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think that unfortunately wraps us up. I think we're out of time for today. So uh, thank you for for coming back on the show and and talking to us about uh, about estimates. It, it's definitely uh, a topic I uh, I debate quite regularly. So it's uh, it's good to be able to uh, to talk about it on the show. Yeah. Well, James, thanks again so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. And thank you to everybody out there listening. I'm James Slutter, and you've been listening to Aaron Upright talking about why developer estimates are always wrong. If you have any questions about this or any other episode, then drop us an email, a tweet, or leave a comment on the website where you can find all the resource links, show notes for each episode. 
And if you enjoy this episode, please leave a review on your favourite podcast platform, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is, and help the cynical developer to reach more developers around the globe.